I go out and talk to a lot of people, uh, developers, um, people in the community, customers, prospects, etc. Uh, and without uh, much exception these days, uh, they want to talk about Kubernetes and how they're either going to do the Kubernetes or how they're doing the Kubernetes and how I can help them do the Kubernetes. Uh, and my first question uh, to them is usually, so that's cool, but like, what problem are you actually trying to solve with the Kubernetes? And usually what happens is they just start saying the word Kubernetes over and over again, louder and louder, because that's what they've decided they want to do. Uh, and so we get to this thing where Kubernetes is this decided thing. And so now you're starting to build problem statements around how you get to Kubernetes, right? Uh, and so you're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to get Kubernetes, therefore I'm going you know, to go to the cloud, I'm going to buy new servers, I'm going like, to migrate all of my apps to prove out the value of having Kubernetes, or I've got to hire like, a team with five years of Kubernetes experience, because it turns out it's actually quite hard. Uh, and so I, this is kind of what I'm doing inside, but I try not to make this face on the outside. Uh, I'm kind of face palming, because you don't actually have a platform problem. Um, but what you've done is you've made uh, Kubernetes your problem uh, and not the solution. So now you're actually like, fixing for Kubernetes rather than fixing for the actual problems you have in your org that might uh, warrant you actually like, developing and using a new platform. Uh, and so I try and refocus what they're talking about in terms of what their actual problems are. So like, I have a develop developer efficiency problem and therefore I want to move to a new platform. And so I even take Kubernetes out of the, out of the story. While well, Kubernetes might be the valid answer for them, I try and just focus on what their actual problems are first, right? So developer efficiency. A lot of people say productivity, um, but I feel like ha that kind of has a connotation that developers are la lazy, which is true, but we shouldn't really point it out like, to their faces. Uh, so developer efficiency, you know, operations complexity, you know, security and patching problem. I have a toil problem. And I think this is the one I always try and, and end up on because like, it's really toil that is, is the issue here. And toil is the thing that's stopping you from getting uh, value, adding value to the business. It's the thing that really stops you from getting from uh, you know, an idea to code to running in production because there's a lot of toil involved in doing that. Um, so you don't have a platform problem. You have a toil problem. You have a problem with just tons of added extra work involved in getting from you know, code to production. That being said, uh, you know, I've said you don't have a platform problem, but here we are, and we're going to talk about platforms. Uh, so my name is uh, Paul Tchaikovsky, and I should have introduced myself by now already. Uh, and I'm a developer advocate at Pivotal Software. And uh, that's a little bit weird, because I'm not a developer. I come from an operations background. I think I'm supposed to call myself a DevOp these days, um, but I never really got into that as a, as a title. Uh, but I've spent most of, uh, a, a lot of my career uh, like building platforms and helping people use platforms uh, rather than using them myself, uh, and often actually failing to build platforms. That was a big part of uh, my life as well, failing to do it. Uh, and so I've learned some things, and I like to share some things. I have some opinions. Uh, so we're going to kind of talk about platforms, like what a platform is, um, the various archetypes of platforms, uh, what we have in the Cloud Foundry community, uh, and also maybe a little bit of what's outside of it. Uh, try and make some sense of it. Uh, you know, I assume everyone here has a basic understanding of like the major archetypes. You know, uh, container platform versus application platform, etc. Um, but we'll talk about what platforms to use for what. Maybe uh, we might talk about uh, you know in what order should you adopt them if you're at a large enterprise and you've got a lot of people and too much work to really just like drop everything and go full on. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some digital transformation and DevOps concepts. Because it turns out just having a platform doesn't actually help you. You've actually got to use it and use it properly. Uh, so that's the goal, and we'll see what we get through. So what is a platform? It is a wall of text. Who, who gives it? Who cares? Let's uh, just keep it simple. So a platform is the environment in which a piece of software is executed, uh, and they abstract away complexity to provide a simpler interface uh, to that execution environment. Different platforms kind of behave differently and have different target users in mind. Uh, so you've got like uh, Cloud Foundry is really a developer-focused platform. So uh, the abstraction is focused on the developer, whereas Kubernetes is kind of more towards being an operator uh, platform. So it's a lot of, lot of its abstractions are focused towards the operator and running systems rather than running apps. Um, very quickly, in the 2018 State of DevOps report, they actually mention uh, platform as a service as something that uh, is a, an indicator of uh, very high-performing groups. 
So while a platform won't magically make you a high-performing company, uh, it's certainly going to help enable those who are on their way to becoming that. Um, so, and really, that goes for any of these platforms when they're used uh, in the correct way. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a modern software pl platform provides a RESTful API, and that drives compute resources, um, CPU, memory, disk, network, right? It looks like this. Like ev every platform looks like this. Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, you know, Amazon Web Services. You've got an API, and that drives some sort of workers, which then drives your actual physical compute resources or virtual compute resources to create an execution environment for your code to run in. Um, my friend Gabe at uh, Microsoft has said that every IT team is a platform team, and that's kind of true because as an IT group, like my job is to run software on servers, and a platform's job is to run software on servers. So we have the same goals, and so as an IT group, like we're empowering ourselves by using platforms that help us do our jobs and help, uh, and help our developers uh, have less toil and have less toil ourselves. Uh, technically, as an IT group, you are a platform, so Jira is your API, and you're, you're, the, you're the workers. And so your ticket comes in, you, as, a, as a security engineer, you consume that ticket, you do a bunch of work through SSH or whatever, and it's done. Um, but you know, that's pretty inefficient, that's what we call a meat cloud, or a cloud made out of people, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's not great. And it kind of looks like this, right? It's a, this massive burning oil fire, and it's all you can do to try and like, contain it, but it's going to keep burning until, to, until the, like, all the oil runs out, and there's some dude uh, like under the under these just squirting more oil up into the fire. So it's a, it's a fight you're never going to win. And so this is where you need to do things like digital transformation. You need to start adopting DevOps processes to like split people away to start focusing on like building new platforms, utilizing new platforms, new processes, etc., so that you can slowly move things away from being on this uh, you know burning platform that uh, is probably never going to get better. But you can slowly like pull pieces of fuel away until there's no more fuel for it to burn. Uh, so we kind of have these major archetypes of platforms, right? From hard, the hardware platform, which I kind of just described, which is just a bunch of people, all the way up to like Cloud Foundry, our application platform, or our function platform. And you basically you have this control versus toil thing. So at the, at the, the far end of it, the, the, the right-hand side, you've got like a lot of toil, but you also have a ton of control. Like you can run any kind of app you want on a bare metal server. Whereas as you come towards the, the, the left here, or the right, your right, I should say, um, you're giving up control, but you're gaining like efficiency. So if you go all the way to say, or well, if you're doing your, uh, your, plat your application platform, you're writing 12 factorish apps, right? So you're writing very opinionated apps in order for them to function uh, correctly inside of that platform. So you know you're giving up. You had that push and pull of uh, control versus efficiency, um, and so you know not every app is going to run in a, a function platform like a serverless platform, right? And so you have to figure out where in that control versus toil uh, area you need to uh, focus at running a, a given app, uh, and every app is going to be a li little bit different. Uh, the platforms kind of build on that. I mean. It's, Good platforms are like onions or ogres, right? They have layers and they build on top of each other. Uh, when Google created their Google uh, Kubernetes engine, they didn't create a new IaaS. They used their Google Compute uh, IaaS and layered on top of it, right? And so when you're building platforms or looking for platforms, you want the platforms that like, just focus at one like, area of, this, of the layers uh, and don't try and like, blur the boundaries and that build on top of, one, of them. So don't try and reinvent the entire thing. Uh, there's a ton of platforms uh, at each layer, um, more than I can talk about and more than I really care about. So I'm going to focus on the things that uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation and Pivotal uh, bring to the table. And so you kind of have Bosch as this delineating mark of like above the, above the infrastructure and below the infrastructure. So below the infrastructure, I mean, yes, they're platforms, but... Uh, you know, either you should have a cloud provider run it, or you should have like an infrastructure team run it. And you use Bosch as the delineation to then say, okay, these are the platforms that we're really going to focus our, our end users at, because these are the ones that are going to provide the efficiency. And having Bosch as that installer and uh, guideline also means that uh, we have a lot of choices around the actual like infrastructure platform that we use. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen 
this uh, from Onzi from three years ago, I think it was, uh, the CF Push Haiku. And this kind of really demonstrates that toil uh, aspect of like how much work you have to do to deploy an application in Cloud Foundry. So like here's my source code, run it on the cloud for me, I don't care how. So clearly I don't have to do a ton of work, but also I don't have an opinion. So I have to like do it however the cloud or however Cloud Foundry wants me to do it. Whereas with uh, Kubernetes, it's kind of a longer poem. Like here's my source code, I built it into a container just now, please run it for me. This YAML will tell, it, will tell you how. So clearly I have to build an image and I have to provide some form of instructions and then Kubernetes will run it for me. So that's definitely more toil, but it's also giving more, me more control because I have a, a deployment manifest which is telling Kubernetes how to run it for me. It's a kind of a, a way to compare them. And then serverless, like here's a function, just run it every time you see an, an event, right? Uh, and that's not entirely accurate because the uh, the function or serverless uh, uh, stuff is so new. Like some, you just give them your, your source code or, your, or, the, or just a snippet of function. Some you will actually have to build a container and ship it up there. So the toil involved in serverless is not quite settled yet. Um, but I don't think, um, apart from a few unicorns, not a lot of us are actually using serverless uh, yet anyway. So obviously Pivotal Cloud Foundry, well obviously Cloud Foundry Foundation and then Pivotal are around and we kind of have an opinionated set of platforms. Originally we had just Cloud Foundry. Uh, the changing landscape said to us, hey, you need more than that. So uh, the Cloud Foundry container runtime was born and then uh, Pivotal PKS, the Kubernetes service wrapped around that was born. And then there's also the, uh, the function stuff. So Riff and Knative, et cetera, sort of bubbling up. Um, and you know, we'll see some sort of Pivotal service around that uh, at some point. And then Pivotal also brings this like services marketplace, uh, which kind of brings like the ability to run databases and some other, and some other like shared services. Uh, and then they're kind of like a loosely coupled group of platforms. So you can have one of them, you can have all of them, um, but they're loosely coupled in the fact that they share some services, like share like some networking, they share security models, uh, they share um, uh, networking, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they're all kind of installed and managed by Bosch. Uh, and you know, Pivotal adds a bunch of operation, op day two operations to doing it, but it's all available open source as well, so you don't need to pay Pivotal money if you don't want to. Uh, and also Bosch allows you to then run it on pretty much any cloud you want. Uh, and so with sort of Cloud Foundry and Bosch and Pivotal taking on a lot of that operational burden, it allows you to focus on like adding value to the business and figuring out like where to run what apps to bring the most value to make that app as efficient as it can uh, in the state it's in. And you can talk about, should I modernize the app? Should I lift and shift it? And that'll help shape you, uh, your decision on which of the platforms you're gonna run it on and then uh, you know, where you're gonna get value out of running it. Uh, so where do we start? Um, you know, a lot of folks are still at that. I basically still just have VMware, uh, sorry, not, not VMware, I still just have hardware or VMware, but I'm not really managing it in any major way. And so I'm still the cloud, I'm still the meat cloud, right? Uh, and so I try to talk to them about how we can start adopting uh, the different platforms in a way that makes sense across the business. Uh, folks like at, across the business should still be experimenting with like all levels of platforms inside Cloud Foundry and out, um, because that's how you learn and how you move to new things. Um, but as a business, you kind of need to make some decisions about where you're going to be focusing. Uh, and so I have some thoughts around that. Obviously, you have hardware or you have some sort of unmanaged VM infrastructure, KVM or basic VMware or something like that. Uh, and there's a good chance you're still going to have hardware around at the end of this, unless you're pushing everything to the cloud, which is another big ball of wax problem that uh, may, not be, may or may not be a good idea depending on your company. Uh, but you know, you're still going to probably have hardware. So you, you're probably going to... If you're old enough, you're going to have some mainframes lying around, and you're probably not going to push your COBOL up to uh, uh, Amazon's Lambda service anytime soon. Uh, you're going to have large storage clusters like Ceph, HDFS. You're going to have databases like MS SQL, Oracle RAT clusters, stuff like that, that you're not going to move them up to like a, a platform anytime soon either. So there's plenty of reasons to have hardware around. You can get better and smarter at running that hardware, utilizing uh, like config management and some of the other stuff that we sort of developed in like the, the, the new cloud world that work really well on, on, on like bare metal hardware as well. So you can still be improving that side of things. And you've still got to run like VMware or something locally anyway if you want to start running uh, other, other platforms, right? Uh, and then of course you've got some sort of software as a service. So it's kind of, it's a level of abstraction. It may not be a platform itself, but uh, 
It's good to have that, like Concur, GitHub, Salesforce, all that sort of stuff. Like, you wouldn't get, gain any value of trying to run like, Salesforce locally if you could, which you can't, but there would be no reason to do that. So kind of think about like, strategically um, grow your SaaS usage based on like, commoditized services that it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to run. And then, like, which platform do you actually start adopting? I usually recommend you kind of jump to both an application platform and an infrastructure platform. So like VMware um, managed by Bosch kind of counts as an infrastructure platform. And then Cloud Foundry or Amazon or Google Compute as your infrastructure platform and Cloud Foundry as your application platform. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, um, almost any application platform requires an infrastructure platform to run on. Uh, Cloud Foundry certainly does. Uh, so you're going to need that anyway. But also, they do have that different focus at uh, different users. So your uh, application focus is definitely focused at your application developers. Uh, and your infrastructure platform is really focused at your operators, your sysadmins, your devopses, et cetera. So you know, you're, you know, at the very least, you're taking any new and you know, maybe some modernized apps, and you're pushing them up to Cloud Foundry, your application platform. And then you're also at the operations level. You're retooling, um, going from like run books in wiki pages to uh, like infrastructure as code using Terraform, config management using Chef, like whatever, to start making your uh, infrastructure platform really strong and really getting use out of that and reducing the toil of like requesting hardware and getting at least basic software installed and running. Uh, and you know, developers should also be like stopping from like SCPing jar files around or even worse practices, uh, and being able to do like a CF push type workflow. Um, and you're probably also going to mo move to like modern languages and frameworks at the same time. So you'll get more Golang, you'll get more uh, like Spring Boot, you'll do some reactive stuff. Um, so you're going to spend some time here, because not only are you doing that, but you also start, need to start thinking about building like a, a support platform, or I, I like to call it an SRE platform. Uh, and that's where you've got like a bunch of communal tooling that your operations teams and your developer teams will use for like monitoring, logging, uh, telemetry, access control, uh, event queue, stuff like that. Um, even like credential management, like password management, uh, secret management, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, so you, like Prometheus, Sensu, Bastion, Bastion servers, OAuth servers, you know, all that sort of stuff. We'll sort of build that to be like a SRE platform off to the side that help provide the tooling to your operators, developers, and also endpoints for your other platforms to send logs, monitoring, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to use SAFs services for that. So like, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not very good at monitoring, you like get Datadog or you know, one of those external SaaS companies to help you out, because um, you know, they're probably much better at running monitoring infrastructure than you are. So if you're, if you're willing to pay the price that they charge, um, because you'd rather focus on other value-added things, then that's a, definitely a, a good thing to look at. So don't feel like you have to run any or all of this yourself. Uh, it just depends on what comfort level you are at uh, getting partners in to help you uh, do that sort of thing. Uh, and then, like, we all know now that the world is moving to containers. Like, any platforms we're adopting for this foreseeable future will be, will be container-based. And so start thinking about containers for like, basically all levels of your infrastructure. Uh, applications in your platforms, because uh, they're a good general solution for that build, package, ship, and run. Um, uh, and of course, do it where it makes sense. So don't start running all your MySQL servers in, uh, in containers. But you're going to have a lot of applications that may not, may not go into Cloud Foundry, but are still going to be really good for running in containers. And running containers, say, on VMs or in bare metal, are still going to get you to start exercising those muscles and learning how to actually uh, operationalize containers and figure out how you, you know, get logging and monitoring and stuff from containers. Um, so it's worthwhile doing. And if you're using config management, which you should for your uh, you know, VMs, hardware and stuff, um, it's, just as easy, it's just as easy to like, grab, download, and run a Docker image as it is an apt package or a jar file. So you, know, you might as well start doing that and have that kind of unified build, uh, build package, ship, run sort of uh, tooling. Uh, and then, so if you want that, then obviously you need to have some sort of image uh, Docker registry um, as part of your SRE platform. So uh, something like uh, one of the enterprise ones, like Harbor or Quay, they do not just the, the registry, but they also do like security scanning, 
uh, allow for signing of images and stuff like that, which is important because if we don't bring security into doing this with us, um, they're going to remain that sort of the pe folks at the end that just always say no to us. So we, we want to drag them in to like, be part of this process with us. Uh, and then, as well as the SRE platform, uh, you should be building some sort of continuous integration. Hopefully, you already have this stuff, but you should be making, like, solidifying it and building it as like, a communal set of tooling that uh, anyone uh, that deploys applications uh, in your org can start to use. Uh, and so really, it's going to become part of your SRE platform or whatever you call it, but I'm calling it out separately just uh, to make sure it's called out. Uh, so you're going to have a tool like Concourse or Jenkins, uh, and it's going to run tests and build artifacts every time you make a code change, and also every time you make changes to like, your infrastructure's code or your config management. Because remember, we have a bunch of different platforms we're dealing with here. Uh, and these tests, again, should include like, security and compliance testing, as well as like, your unit test code coverage and stuff. Because again, it's important to bring security into the, into the conversation uh, and you know, start talking about like DevSecOps or whatever it is you need to talk about to get them involved. Because um, the further uh, left we take them in the like, uh, development process, the more integrated they're going to be and the more secure your software is going to be. Um, and also, the less they'll be saying no right at the end when you're trying to get like, a, a last minute deploy out, right? And you can't really do effective continuous delivery or continuous deployment unless security is actually involved in that uh, pipeline. Uh, and so once you've got C under control, CI under control, you can start doing, uh, looking at continuous delivery. You can use the same tool as CI, or you can use a more uh, continuous delivery tool like uh, Spinnaker. Uh, and again, changes, either code or config management, uh, should be deployable to any uh, environment at the press of a button. And then based on your confidence in what you're doing, on uh, the risk you're willing to accept for the individual apps, you can then automate that entire thing so it's continual deployment. But like that's like, eventually, you want to get things to continual deployment. But just getting things to the point where you can deliver code to production anytime you press a button is, is a very, like it's a big step, and it's super important. Uh, and then so, yeah, and so now you have CI and CD. Uh, so every new app and every new app and every map, every app you modernize. Uh, to one of your new platforms, you should put through some sort of pipeline that is basically you put code in and you get a running application out the other side. There's some example uh, tools up along the pipeline, but use whatever you feel you need. And then you've got that sort of faucet at the end. So if you want to do like continuous deployment and let it deploy itself, go for it. Otherwise, you can have you know, a human actually as the gate to press the button to do the deployment. Uh, again, based on just your confidence in your automation, the risk you're willing to accept, the type of compliance you're under for the type of industry you're in, that sort of stuff. So you've got a good handle now on your like, infrastructure platform and your application platform, so like VMware or Amazon and your uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, you can, you've got more applications running on those than not. Uh, all, at least all your new applications are going towards them. Um, and it, everything you've got more stuff going through uh, CI, CD than not. You can start looking at like, the next platform, which I think is your container orchestrator or container platform. Uh, and that's probably going to be Kubernetes, because uh, that's winning the container wars. Uh, and again, so it's again back to being kind of an operator play. So you can have operators basically uh, building manifests, Helm charts, and maybe even Kubernetes operators to run and manage services inside of Kubernetes to make it really easy to, like if you need an Elasticsearch cluster or a Cassandra cluster for an app, you might want to run those in Kubernetes and have um, a fairly easy way to deploy those anytime a new app is deployed that needs those things. Uh, and then as well as that, it gives you a good opportunity to start looking at uh, lift and shifting some of your legacy applications that aren't 12-factor and are probably never going to be 12-factor, but are still reasonably able to be containerized and deployed in a container orchestrator. Um, I, I know I can run any old garbage in a container platform. I, I, maybe I shouldn't run all kinds of garbage in one, but I can. And so you're going to play that, like, is, is it worth moving? Like, what's the value of the app uh, and stuff? And there's like uh, a bunch of methodologies around doing that. There's the Gartner time methodology, where you basically look at the, the technical quality of the app versus the, the business value of the app, and you put it on a on a, on, a, a, on a plot graph, and based on where it is, you're like, I'm going to modernize it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just leave it as it is, I'm going to lift and shift it, or whatever. And so that's a really good way of determining uh, where you should be running your apps. 
Uh, so that's, okay, now you've got a container platform, you're starting to use it. And then you can really start looking at your serverless or function platform. Uh, and that's where you're, like, you're now doing like, event-driven event functions that are tied together with some sort of business logic. You've got like, a, an event queue and the business logic kind of managing how information flows between different, different uh, functions or serverless apps. And so that's a fairly large leap. Uh, and not, not every app is going to be good at running in that way. Uh, and so like, don't, don't rush into trying to do serverless. Like, if you have a couple of teams that are like real unicorn teams, throw them on, like, send them out to Lambda and start doing stuff there. But don't make it a, a business focus. Because uh, the, the, like, the initial business value is all going to be at the like, infrastructure platform and application platform if you're still fairly uh, you know, getting started. Uh, and then so there's no point having a platform. Like, there's no point just deploying a bunch of platforms and like, going, OK, we're done. Right? You actually, actually have to use those platforms uh, and use them effectively. And so you need to go through some sort of uh, digital transformation. You start, need to start adopting a DevOps culture. Uh, and it's hard. Uh, it's a lot of work. And it is going to get worse before it gets better. So this is the J-curve of transformation uh, from the state of DevOps report, which is by uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgram and her co-authors. Uh, and you, know, you can see clearly here, you, know, you have um, some, some early wins, and things look good. And then you start like, trying to push it across like, a larger array of applications and stuff. And it gets, gets quite difficult. You've got a lot of issues with you writing a lot more tests. So you have to get those tests written. You've got a lot of uh, uh, technical debt to deal with, et cetera. But eventually, you'll, if you stick with it, you climb out of that sort of that, that trough, and you start to actually really uh, receive the value. Uh, and, so, uh, and you'll start to see the return. Um, but you need to actually make sure you are getting that return, so you need to be measuring things, which means you need to actually figure out what you're trying to achieve um, with your platform and with your digital transformation. Um, so uh, DBS Bank is the largest bank in Southeast Asia. And at Spring One Platform just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Su Chu So, I hope I said that right, uh, we talked about their digital transformation. Uh, the URL for the talk is up there. Uh, and it was a really, really, really good talk. I think it was probably the best of the keynotes of the whole, uh, of the whole event. Uh, and she uh, kind of had this slide, which was about uh, setting their goals. So they had goals around like agility, uh, user, user experience, so like the usability of their applications. Um, the quality, so like security, controls, uh, and then developer productivity or developer efficiency, as I would prefer to say. Right? So they had these goals in, line, in mind, and then so they then would figure out ways to measure for these things. So as they started replatforming, as they started going through the digital transformation, they could see that they were actually getting value, they were actually getting a return on the investment they were putting into this. Um, you certainly don't do this to save money, especially not at first. Um, platforms are not cheap, either through uh, licensing or through just sheer people time. Uh, and so, you know, don't think you're going to adopt a platform and, like, in six months' time, be saving money. Maybe in a couple of years' time, when things are really rock solid on it, you'll be saving money, um, but certainly not initially. Uh, and then, of course, the second word in digital transformation is uh, transformation. So you have to actually change, uh, and you kind of need to almost rebuild your organization focused around the, uh, the contracts and abstractions uh, that you want your platforms to rely on, to, uh, to be around, right? Uh, and then you're going to build engineering teams at each of these levels and get out of their way and let them engineer. Um, and then those folks, you want them to basically build a paved road uh, that your app development teams can like, follow that road and get services like logging and monitoring, telemetry, and whatever, uh, and basically that that helps remove that whole thing of shadow IT. Like, if, you, if your platform is the best option, they're not going to try and go and use their you know, corporate credit card to use something else. Um, but you also need to let them do other things as well. Like, if they want to build an experiment outside of this like, set of platforms you've built, you should let them. Uh, they just lose access to this paved road, and they lose access to all these things that you're doing for them. And so it's you know, in their best interest to uh, follow that paved road. And that's kind of the Netflix model. Um, they're allowed to do whatever the hell they want, but most people at Netflix follow that, that paved road and use like Spinnaker and use all of the tooling in, involved in that to uh, stick with there and get kind of all that, all that really good stuff for free. Uh, yeah, and so you're going to re, 
like change a business, you're gonna like we at Pivotal we've seen a lot of success where we have like built an infrastructure team that are really focused on your infrastructure and are building some form of API layers or whatever uh, up to the rest of the business. And then you have a platform team that utilize that to start to build out your platforms, uh, but also to build out your shared services like your SRE platform, like I was talking about. So like messaging, uh, credentials, certificates, um, secrets, middleware, all that sort of stuff. A platform team sort of takes on that and builds abstractions for those things uh, for the actual developers to do. So the developers are just focused on like taking an idea, putting it into code, and getting that shipped to production um, without having to worry about all those extra things. And so you sort of build teams around that um, rather than just having like one big IT group, one big whatever group. Uh, and that, that has worked really well uh, with us working with some of our customers and, and whatnot. Uh, and then as you start adopting platforms, you always want to have an, uh, an eye to moving things up the stack. Like strategically, the, the further up uh, the stack, um, the more efficiency you get out of it and therefore the more value you get out of it. So as you're going through, you kind of have your current state, you have a future state. Start thinking about like what percentage of what types of apps you want running where. Um, and you're going to do that based on the value they're bringing to the business, their technical quality, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, obviously, new apps should immediately go straight to you know, either the application platform Cloud Foundry, or if you have one already, a serverless platform. Um, and then as you like, start lift and shifting apps up the stack, start modernizing apps up the stack, and start moving things up the stack, so you have as little as possible running in the hardware and, and uh, infrastructure platforms. You can also look at like what technologies you're using for a given app now versus what do I want to use on them. So like uh, I have a bunch of web logic and web sphere stuff. That's probably going to be pretty good to run in uh, in Cloud Foundry, right? Whereas if you have like some older stuff that's being managed by like Chef or Puppet, that might be a really good target to look at your uh, container platform. So it's another way of taking look, kind of looking at your apps and sort of doing a gut check of like what platform might this uh, best run on. Um, back to DBS Bank, uh, like you can adopt a platform and you can set, start to get value from that fairly quickly, but your actual true digital transformation to get your entire organization uh, getting that value uh, is going to take some time. DBS Bank took like four years to get from where they were to like where they are now, which is, uh, you know, they're really they're using Cloud Foundry in a really good way. They're doing a lot of CI, CD, um, but it's like, there's no end to this. Like part of the whole thing is like it's, it's it's all about continuous improvement. So it's not like you like okay, I've installed Cloud Foundry. I'm using a CI/CD platform. I'm done. There's always some some room to improve, right? But you do certainly have like a I'm I'm really bad at this to I'm pretty good at this as like a, as a box out time. Turns out it took about four years for DBS, but they're a very large bank in a heavily regulated industry. So it, it would make sense that it would take longer for them than maybe uh, someone at a smaller business or a less regulated business. So you might be able to get a fair chunk of the way through a digital transformation in a year, in a year or two, or even less if you're a fairly small organization. Uh, and then if you, if you use, utilize tooling and partners to help you build and run platforms and help you, and help you learn how to actually write software and modernize software to use that platforms, that will just help to accelerate you as well. Uh, digital transformation does provide proven ROI. Um, Pivotal has any number of anecdotes we can tell you about customers and people that we've helped uh, sort of go through digital transformation, uh, start doing you know, cloud native development, uh, and the returns they're getting from that and the values they've gotten from that. Um, if you read uh, Accelerate, by, again, by Dr. Nicole Forsgrim and her co-authors, uh, the DevOps, the yearly DevOps report, uh, and there's another, a lot of other places that give good solid anecdotes on people that have gone through some sort of you know, DevOps culture shift or digital transformation and have proven like, business like, value out of it, has proven that it's actually imp increased their bottom line and they're actually uh, you know, making more money because they've gone through such a transformation. Uh, at Pivotal, um, so you want to like, measure these things and you want to actually uh, graph these things. So before you even start replatforming an application, you want to measure where it's at and then watch what happens to those measurements as you replatform, as you modernize, and as you optimize them for a given platform. Uh, at Pivotal, we talk, talk about the five S's, so like security, speed, scalability, stability, and savings. 
And so if you're mapping all of those things for your apps, uh, you, you'll, as you start to um, re-platform them, re them and modernize them, you'll definitely see improvements there. Um, if you don't, then stop and focus on another app, right? Uh, you do want to get some early wins, uh, and you, want, you really want to show this value to the business, because that's how you get the rest of the business to adopt it. Because generally speaking, like the digital transformation will start, especially in a large org, will start in like one, one, uh, one group, right? And then you, you need to get people above you, directors, uh, people at the sea level, to become like uh, evangelists and advocates for the way you're doing th that things. And the way you do that is you prove to them that you're actually making them money, right? Not just saving them money, but actually making them money. And then they'll very quickly say to the rest of the organization, hey, you all need to get on this train, and you all need to do that. So measure it, um, create objectives, and measure those uh, measurements against the objectives, uh, and prove that you're actually uh, creating that value and adding that value. So that is it. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, we probably have time for, for questions and answers. Uh, so if we do have questions, uh, we have a mic. Uh, if we don't have questions, we can break for coffee or hang out or do whatever. <laughs>